Thank you very much, Costas, for uh, your kind introduction. Indeed, uh, my excuse for coming back to this place, I like to come here frequently. Uh, there are splendid recollections of earlier visits, but today the diet excuse is Pierre Fayet's uh, uh, apparent uh, date of retirement. And as other speakers uh, this morning have said, we hope that he won't take that too literally and that he will only retire on paper but still continue doing physics. So, yes, and um, uh, while coming here uh, in this institute, normally we discuss the things that are most on our minds. And um, what is on my mind these days is black hole physics. So I'm going to talk about black holes. The title of my contribution is um, is the hydrogen atom for quantum gravity. I, don't, I think many people will not be surprised that what I mean by this is that the Schwarzschild black hole is as elementary an object as the hydrogen atom is for the theory of quantum mechanics. You know, when Schrodinger wrote down his equations, one of the first things people did was try to understand how the hydrogen atom really works, because Niels Bohr had a sort of vague idea about, uh, about how to make an atomic model uh, out of quantum mechanics, or quantum theory it was then called. But now Schrodinger turned quantum theory into quantum mechanics. So now we had the equations. And now we had the equations, we can uh, again turn to the hydrogen atom and find that those equations can be exactly solved for the hydrogen atom with great precision. And in fact, we teach that to our undergraduate students nowadays how to do that. We want something similar for quantum, quantum gravity. And my claim is we have something similar for quantum gravity. It's called the black hole. Now, black holes can come in a number of shapes, very limited. But are, yes, you can have different shapes of black holes, called the Kerr black hole, the Kerr Newman black hole, um, and, and, uh, and others. But um, the most primary fundamental prototype of the black hole is just a Schwarzschild black hole. Schwarzschild only a few months after Einstein had formulated his theory of general relativity, Carl Schwarzschild, a well-known astronomer in his day, was uh, said, well, if you write down the equations, I know how to solve them for the easiest case, the spherically symmetric case. And that became known as a Schwarzschild solution. What Schwarzschild couldn't have known, and unfortunately he died a few months after writing that paper, so so he never learned all the commotion that his solution brought about. Because it turned out that he, what he really was describing was the black hole. And this only the, the, the details of the black hole only discovered many years later by various other physicists who figured out what the thing really was that he was describing with his equations. So um, indeed, much later, a, another gentleman came on the scene called Stephen Hawking. He's on this picture, the figure here. He's standing between Einstein and Newton in an episode of Star Trek when <laughs> Hawking was once uh, visiting the studios of, uh, uh, I think, Universal Studios of where Star Trek <laughs> movies were made. He said, I want to figure in one of these episodes. So they said, yes, that's a good idea. And so in some some time machine or some warp or something or other, uh, Einstein and Newton are being revived and uh, invited to play a game of poker together with, uh, with another famous physicist, Stephen Hawking. And, um, and then one of, this, of the characters of Star Trek uh, is setting up this poker game because he wants to play poker to the most famous minds of the universe, and that's these three other people. And, um, well, you can, you can guess who won the poker game, but that's, uh, uh, that's another thing. So um, my subject today is now what Hawking did to black holes. What he discovered was if you apply the known laws of physics, you, we understand how, uh, today particularly, we understand quite well how the standard model works. But already in his days, it was reasonable to think that quantum field theory describes a world of subatomic particles. So, he, he just took the quantum theory of the subatomic particles and applied it to black holes. And at first, he was struggling with the problem because something very strange came out. He first wanted to describe empty space. 
what's the vacuum like near the black hole? And his equations gave conflicting answers. He couldn't really make out the vacuum. He thought, how stupid am I? I, I, I cannot even write down empty space. What's happening here? He found out that space-time around the black hole can't be empty. There must be particles there. And he actually, at first he didn't believe his eyes, but then when he worked out the equations further, he found that particles are emitted by a black hole at a constant rate, as if a black hole is actually glowing with a certain temperature. And when he realized this, he realized that his computation was saying something new about black holes, which was not understood before, the fact that black holes emit particles. Now, all this would have been fine, except that the way he described those uh, made many people believe that this cannot be right. There is something fundamentally wrong about what his results were. But there was nothing wrong in his calculations. So there was something wrong in his interpretation of the calculations. Or there's something wrong about quantum field theory. There's something wrong about general relativity. Because if you combine them together the way it should be done according to the textbooks, he gets something very strange. He gets that the black hole itself does not obey any Schrodinger equation because it turns a pure wave function into a mixture of wave functions, a thermal mixture. And uh, in particular, in particle physics, uh, my colleagues in particle physics said that cannot be right. And I, I soon joined them saying this cannot be right. There is something that has to be modified. And the importance of this is that, yes, we don't understand how the laws of, of gravity behave when you add quantum mechanics to them. It's called quantum gravity. Yes, we've, we discovered the name of the theory, but we haven't discovered the theory itself yet. So uh, we don't know how to, under, how to write down the closed equations for quantum gravity. Many people believe that string theory gives the answer. But string theory says something quite different from what Stephen Hawking said. String theory said, yes, there are objects like black holes, but they, they don't do this crazy thing about turning uh, pure states into mixed states. No, they remain pure as objects. So string theorists agree that Hawk, somewhere, somewhere along the line, Hawking does something wrong. But we, they couldn't put their finger on what he did wrong. And neither could Hawking himself, so Hawking opposed. So this led Len Lenny Susskind, the, the particle physicist, to get into a battle with Stephen Hawking. He calls it the black hole war, but I am not so much in favor of calling it a war because we're all friends with each other. We don't really fight each other as enemies, but we are in dispute. And this was a dispute about whether quantum mechanics survives its behavior, the behavior of black holes. So if you take a black hole, can you write down a Schrodinger equation for a black hole? If so, that Schrodinger equation would be very similar to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. So there should be some similarity. And I'm going to talk about that similarity, which was not found because I think many of my colleagues, in, in particular in string theory, but also in other branches of physics, also in general relativity, they <coughs> took an attitude which I don't quite agree with. So anyway, um, <coughs> about 30 years ago, I started to write papers about this and uh, devised some algebra. And since then, very little happened. So now I'm very puzzled by this. Why did nobody else do the thing which, which could have been done 30 years ago? Only just very recently it was done. And what was done was apply um, the modified laws to a black hole, modify the theory. I'll explain how to modify the theory in a way which I think is, is it does agree with modern theory, but you have to think more carefully about how to do it. And then you discover that in a very unusual basis of Hilbert space, now that's quantum mechanics is about Hilbert spaces and about states in Hilbert space. If you use a very special way of characterizing states in Hilbert space, then you discover that the black hole is indeed described by a Schrodinger equation. And you can write down that Schrodinger equation and find out that it is very similar. It is, has very many things in common with a hydrogen atom. So, but you have to pay a price. Black holes are not the way they, they are thought that they behave, but there is some, some modifications you have to bring about in the theory. I now find those modifications very, very natural, and there's nothing very strange about them. But you have to think about it. If you don't, you, you get a picture of a black hole, so it doesn't make sense logically. And we all know that somehow nature 
manages to make all laws of nature logical. So this was the first demand. We want to have a consistent theory of black holes. We want everything to fit into place. And the importance of this is that eventually we want to understand everything about quantum gravity, not only black holes, but everything else as well. Now, black holes play a very important role in understanding the gravitational force. So if it doesn't work for black holes, we should better uh, try and start again. So we want a theory that works for black holes, and then we can possibly find out how it works under all other circumstances and how to do quantum gravity properly. So, um, so there were some very striking conclusions I'll try to explain in this talk, which is that um, um, you have to modify the boundary conditions, and I'll explain what it is. So there's some funny thing happening with topology of space and time. And um, that funny thing has to do with antipodes. If you look at one side of the black hole, you can look at the point opposite to the black hole, and you find there's a relation there that people have missed all the time and now only becomes clear. The other thing is the black hole has no interior. Normally speaking, people talk about falling into the black hole. And once you pass the horizon, you're inside. Well, you're not inside, but I'll, I'll explain that. And um, this is unlike what is called the classical black hole. With classical, I mean still the general relativity in full swing, but, um, but not quantum mechanical. So you, if you ignore quantum mechanics, the black hole is exactly as uh, Schwarzschild described it. And the way Schwarzschild described well, Schwarzschild didn't, didn't have the time to describe it that way, but the, the way the, the solution was later described by other physicists was that there's an interior region and there's an exterior region. The exterior region is like in, in the ordinary world, describing the universe of particles surrounding a black hole. But there's an interior region as well. If you fall into the black hole, you enter into the interior, into its belly, so to speak. And, uh, You'll, you'll die there because the, 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 the black hole will digest you very uh, thoroughly. But um, this was the classical description. Now, when you try to apply quantum mechanics, something completely different comes out. And I'll try to explain that. So it, all this could have been derived 30 years ago, but it wasn't. And I don't quite understand why it wasn't. But that, well, I understand why I didn't do it because I was busy with other things. I didn't. Uh, my understanding is limited. I, you know, I'm not at all as smart as Cosmos likes to portray me. But I also have my shortcomings, so I couldn't derive it myself. But I thought there are thousands of other physicists. Someone could have found it, but no. And um, um, uh, so the the arguments are, are quite simple, and can't, I'll try to explain them here. So what Stephen Hawking did was that he described the region near the horizon of a black hole. The horizon is a mathematical sphere you draw around it that has a property that once you pass it, you can't go back. You go over the horizon, so to speak, and you are lost for eternity, at least according to classical physics. Now, when you come close to the horizon, you discover that, that for a local observer, it looks like something else. It looks like a point in space but that's because I suppressed two coordinates, two, two, two transverse coordinates. A point on the horizon is characterized by two angles, like a point on the planet Earth is also characterized by two angles. So those two angles I suppress for a moment, and then there's just a single point here. But as time goes on for a distant observer, the equal timelines are these lines all around here. But um, a, a point that stays at constant distance from the horizon is describing hyperbola. To make that hyperbola, you need an acceleration, and that's the gravitational force, actually. So um, if you undo that, then a freely falling observer just make a follow a straight line in this, in this plot. But this looks like a singular point. That singular point is where Schwarzschild himself thought there was a singularity. But it's not a singularity. It's about as singular as a North Pole of planet Earth. So imagine a polar bear walking on the North Pole that polar bear wouldn't, couldn't care at all whether there's a singularity in our coordinate frame. He would just walk right through it and not even think about, notice anything about a singularity. So for the polar bear, the North Pole is just ordinary flat landscape. Similar to this point here, a local polar bear would just go right through without noticing anything. And that is what made Hawking derive the property of the vacuum space here, that he thought this was vacuum space, but it isn't. If you if you translate what a distant observer would see, the distant observer will see particles. And that was his derivation. So 
but he also divided, decided on something else, that he produces a mixed state. Now, this is the one important equation that I hope the physicists in the, in the room at least will, uh, will understand, that the mixed state is a so-called entangled state. It is the so-called Hartle-Hawking state. And the Hartle-Hawking state says that, that there's two regions in the black hole. Region one is the outside universe. Region two is something, we don't know what it is, something inside the black hole. And um, in both region one and region two, you can have particles with energies E and other quantum numbers N. And then Hartle and Hawking derived, or Hawking himself derived, that the, the shape of the wave function is this. Now, if you don't see the things which are in region two, then whenever you measure something, you have to average over those states. And that turns this thing into what we call a quantum mixed state. It's not a pure state anymore. It's like a thermal state. The black hole is like a light bulb emitting light, but the light bulb is raised to a certain temperature by the electricity current going through it. And at that temperature state is not described as a single pure quantum state, but as a probabilistic distribution of different quantum states. So that's what Hawking said, that the black hole turns into a probabilistic distribution. The states in region two will never be observed anymore. Once you're inside the black hole, you can't get out. So that was it. So there's an inside and an outside. But there's something fundamentally wrong about this. The claim now is this cannot be right. We have to reconsider what actually this expression means. Well, the expression came out of solid mathematics about quantum field theory. There's no doubt that this expression is basically correct. So what is it? Why are we getting, why should the black hole behave differently? So according to Hawke himself, he said, well, it's too bad for quantum mechanics. My black hole itself is not a quantum mechanical thing. And he also explained why that is so. The black hole is a corridor between one, re one universe and another universe. There's a wormhole. So anybody who falls into a black hole might re-emerge into another, out of another black hole that is described by region two. And um, he, uh, he, he tried to make sense out of this. But particle physicists said, that's not the way objects in the real physical world behave. B if black holes behave like that, then that takes away the, the bottom out of our theories of matter and particles. <coughs> this cannot be right. Something else must be going on. And then we turn to super string theory, or string theory in general, which is the big candidate theory for quantum gravity. Not the only candidate, but I th do think the most important candidate theory of quantum gravity is string theory and super strings. <coughs> So what does super string theory tell? And that's what all my friends who do string theory are telling me. Super strings know about black holes. There are objects there which in all respects behave like black holes. And you can compute their properties. And lo and behold, the black holes that we get out of that do not turn pure states into mixed states. They are just ordinary pure objects. So problem solved, that's, that's what it is. But string theory then doesn't tell you why Hawking came to a uh, quote unquote a wrong answer. And um, so what does the, the, that string black hole have to do with quantum fluctuations near the horizon? What is a horizon in a string? All these questions I always ask string theorists, you know, answer to me, why, why do you get a contradiction here? And they, they don't give an answer, they said, said well, String theory just tell me these are the black holes. And if you have problems with space and time, just throw space and time away. They are emergent. And uh, I didn't like that idea at all. So there must be something else going on. So I said, I'm not going to believe string theory at this point. I'm going to see what else I can do to understand black holes. So then came, much more recently, a paper by four, these four people, uh, Almeri, uh, Marov, Polchinski, and Sully, who discovered a difficulty in black holes. But there was a difficulty that was quite clear from the beginning, and that is the so-called firewall difficulty. What's the firewall? Well, Hawking predicted that the black hole emits particles. But those particles are emitted by the vacuum itself. Where do these particles come from? Well, they, somehow they come from the past in the black hole. They were there all the time. But if you do that, then the particles which have been queuing up in the horizon, waiting to get out, they form an infinite curtain of, of energy of particles. And the problem they, they hit upon was that they couldn't <coughs> dispose of, of that curtain of 
particles. In fact, they said the particles form a firewall. A firewall is a defense region that stops you from falling into a black hole. So if you try to fall into a black hole, you won't get through the horizon because there's this infinite procession of Hawking particles waiting to get out. They will kill you. So, but when you say that, you say Einstein was wrong because Einstein would have said, no, no, you can use any coordinate frame you like. Your uh, local coordinate frame will not show you where the horizon actually is. So certainly there will not be any firewall. So there was a big fight going on. Is there or is there not a firewall? And um, again, the verdict is that the theory itself that we have today doesn't answer this question properly. So many people believe there's some new physics going taking place here, and we don't know what it is. This is why this subject is so tremendously important for theoretical physicists. We want to understand why, what kind of new physics will that be, and how can that improve our understanding of how to reconcile gravity with quantum mechanics. So if we can't solve it for this case, forget it. We'll never be able to quantize gravity properly. So the price is indeed that there will be new physics. And the verdict will be about string theory. String theory is not foolproof. That is the least thing one can discuss. Perhaps string theory does say the same things that I'm, which I'm going to derive now, but it hasn't betrayed that, and it hasn't, uh, hasn't come up with these answers by all by itself. So string theory not always gives you the answers that you want to get. There's something missing there. So, um, and, um, uh, so now let me try to explain what you have, and I think there are three important observations that you have to make. If you don't understand any one of these three observations, you won't understand the black hole. <coughs> and the first thing is that whenever a particle goes into a black hole, yes, it interacts with the Hawking particles coming out. That interaction should not be ignored. So many of my friends in particle physics and in general relativity say, what do you mean these particles interact? Maybe there's a tiny interaction. That will be a weak secondary effect. Like it is in a standard model. Particles go through each other, but every now and then a particle interacts with another particle. But that's a secondary effect. And uh, if you want to know what state the, rock, the black hole can be in, forget these interactions for a moment. Right? We do this in perturbation theory. We start with the case that particles do not interact. And the interaction is introduced at a, as an afterthought later. Now, first you have to understand that's wrong. You have to include the, in the interactions right from the beginning, in particular the gravitational interactions. Why is that? Well, that's precisely because gravity cannot be handled by ordinary theories. Gravity, we could say, is not renormalizable. It means that if you go to understand the gravitational force at very short distances, then you discover that um, uh, uh, that gravity go becomes infinite in strength. So the gravitational force is divergent. It becomes infinitely strong. This you cannot ignore. You cannot ignore a force that becomes infinitely strong. And this is precisely the point here. If you don't handle gravity precisely, correctly, you get an infinite force between ingoing particles and outgoing particles. In fact, the statement that Hawking particles form a firewall already implies this. The firewall becomes infinite in strength. So when another particle wants to go through that firewall, he has to go through an infinite curtain or screen of particles. You can't get through that without, uh, without being killed. So this is the problem of a divergence in the gravitational force. You have to realize this. That was point number one. Point number two is, yes, you can, you can take that effect into account. And the effect is linear. Now, General relativity is always portrayed as a nonlinear theory. The gravitational force is fundamentally nonlinear. That's because gravity carries energy and momentum itself. And so gravity is a source of gravity. That makes your equations complicated, nonlinear. However, this effect that the ingoing particles interact with the outgoing particles, that effect is a component of gravity which happens to be described by linear equations if you make a certain approximation, which I think is a valid approximation. In that approximation, gravity is perfectly linear. It's so much so that, I reach, um, that what you can do is you can make a decomposition of the waves of particles going in and waves of particles going out called the, the spherical wave decomposition. Exactly the same thing as people do in the hydrogen atom when you say the wave function of an electron can be decomposed into spherical harmonics. 
And for every single spherical harmonic mode of the electron in the hydrogen atom, you just have a very simple differential equation, which, which in fact you can solve. Uh, and you can look up in the math, math books if you can't solve it. But it's very easy. So the same thing happens for the black hole. By the expanding a black hole into spherical harmonics, everything becomes very easy. And you can see what happens. And what you see is something very, very strange. You see that the thing makes no sense unless you assume something that wasn't realized before, which is a relation between the point on the black hole and the opposite point. You have to assume something there which is out of the ordinary. But the more now I've been uh, <coughs> confronted with this situation, the more I like it. This is the way it should be. And that actually, as I'll explain right now, it, it will turn Hawking's argument into something else. And uh, that something else is that pure states will go into pure states. There will no, not be any mixture of quantum states anymore. But I'll explain why that is so. So if you don't understand any three of these points, you don't understand the black hole. And uh, I, my complaint is that in most other publications about black holes, these three points are not even mentioned. So that's why I don't understand uh, why. Well, in particular, in string theory, it's not mentioned any of these points. And so I believe that the string theories missed something about black holes. So let me try to explain now what what the procedure is. You first have to understand how ingoing particles interact with outgoing particles. And actually, this interaction is rather simple to describe. It's very elementary. What happens with the ingoing particle, that if an outgoing particle comes along, it's being dragged along a little bit. That dragging effect is well known in general relativity. When uh, you look at photons which come uh, which, which come uh, at very short distance from the sun. You look at stars behind the sun. As you know from the Eddington experiment, the stars are being shifted a little bit. That's general relativity causing light to bend. But you can also say the light is, is bent by, um, by the sun because light is being slowed down a little bit and space and time around the sun are curved a little bit. And these two effects cause the photon which goes by the sun to be slowed down a little bit. So when you look at the star at the other side of the sun, you have to screen off, off the light of the sun, of course. So the ideal case would be to look at this when there's a solar eclipse. So then you don't see the sun itself, but you see the stars behind the sun. That light is being slowed down a little bit. You see this, the, the light of the stars a very small fraction of a second later, then you would just see them otherwise. And um, that is basically this effect, called the Shapiro effect. So the Shapiro effect tells you that if there's a very fast particle, which is a source of a gravitational field going in this direction, then another particle that crosses it is being dragged along a little bit. And that distance over which it's dragged, uh, I call u1, u. So u minus means it, that I lose light cone coordinates here. So there's a plus direction and a minus direction. This is the minus direction. And the shift is in the same direction as this particle is moving. And you can calculate this in flat space. The calculation is particularly easy, although you have to work a bit at it because the factor 4 in front is suddenly not so easy anymore. You can make a mistake here. But actually, there's a factor 4, which I can explain if you really want. But uh, it comes out of the basic calculation. The shift is minus 4 times its proportion to the momentum, p, of, the, of the, this particle. So if this momentum is twice as big, the shift becomes twice as big. Very easy. And that, this is an easy part to understand also why this has to be so. It has to do with Lorentz invariant. If you make a Lorentz transformation, the particle gets twice the momentum. It also uh, drags this distance by factor 2. That's easy. And then there's a dependence on the transverse distance. A particle goes here, another particle goes here, but they meet each other at a transverse distance x tilde. And, x, and this, the shift is proportional to the logarithm of that transverse distance. So very, very close by, the shift is very, very large. So that's this minus sign here. The log is a negative and large. At, large, at very large distances, the log also becomes large, but the log is so slowly varying as a function of distance that at large distances, you don't notice this. But at small distances, this log becomes a singularity. So when particles cross each other very closely, the shift effect becomes very big. Well, this is the basic input formula. You can modify it for particles going around a black hole. The only modification comes that from the fact that the, the horizon is a curved. It's a sphere. It's not a, a plain sheet. 
And because the horizon is spherical, you get an extra term in the equations, making the equations a little bit more complicated, but basically it's the same effect. Uh, oh, yes, here it is. Um, so now, if you want to include that, um, think of a, uh, um, a black hole, again, horizon. And now these orange lines, these, these pink lines here, uh, describe Hawking particles coming out of the black hole. Now what happens if I send the particle in is that these Hawking particles are shifted. So if I go back, then you look at the, at the little circle there. The little circle moves up. It's being dragged along by the ingoing particle. Now, if you wait a minute for the uh, uh, outside observer waits a minute, then the ingoing thing is being Lorentz transformed. So the ingoing thing will be closer to the, uh, to the horizon, and the shift will be bigger. So you see the, the red circle moves to, the, to upwards, and the closer this thing comes to the horizon, the faster the red circle moves away. So the Hawking particles move away from the horizon, and the ingoing thing moves towards the horizon. And this effect now, is n you should not ignore. In fact, this is the major effect which, which changes everything for the black hole. So, um, so now, this was in 1986, basically, that, that I proposed this mechanism to be an important mechanism that explains the behavior of black holes. And the argument was very simple and basically straightforward. Assume a single black hole which has some sort of past history. I don't know what the past history is, but let's assume all everything which made the black hole is in a pure quantum state. <coughs> so a collapsing star is described using Schrodinger's equation and everything, and I have a given state that the black hole was put in. I call that BH number one. And that's this in state. And that in state gives rise to a final state. It emits particles. Now let me assume that these particles have to be pure. pure. That's an assumption, but the assumption is logical from a physical point of view. In physics, you only assume that pure states will evolve into pure states. So we assume that purity of quantum mechanical states is preserved. That would be a blasphemy. Hawking would jump up, up and down if he could that uh, this is not right. Uh, but um, my friends uh, in, in particle physics say, yes, this must be right. String theorists say, yes, this must be right. Let's assume it is right. But if you assume this, you also have to make some sort of bend, some change in the laws of nature, because it doesn't come out automatically. What Hawking did was correct in principle. If you apply lone laws of physics, it's not a pure state. But now I say, no, we assume this is a pure state. Something has to give in the equations that you're going to write down to get this. But let's assume it. Then what comes out? Then uh, I say, well, now I can make a modification. I take the same black hole, and I put an extra particle in. I throw a neutrino, just like that, a very soft particle, just a drop in the black hole. Nobody sees a thing. If it were a neutrino, nobody would notice that this neutrino would have a gravitational effect on the black hole. That sounds outlandish, but still, it has its effect. And you can calculate the Shapiro delay due to the single particle as the drop in. Well. No matter how light the particle is, it has a momentum, p minus. And I can compute the effect using this equation. Now, what it says here is I describe this equation in quantum notation. In quantum notation, I say, well, the outgoing particles are now being dragged along a little bit. I can compute quantum mechanically what this does to the wave function. It, I apply the displacement operator, which is the exponent of the momentum p plus of the outgoing particles. And when the p plus drags along the, the, with an equation u for u minus, which is the formula I just wrote down before. This u minus is basically, or delta u minus, is a shift cost. So this is the equation. And that means that, that the black hole, the outstate of the black hole, is not equal to the outstate of the original black hole, but it, it is a shifted outstate. So it's called BH number 2. And, um, and now I say, wait a minute. Now I'm going to use linearity. I can repeat this process. I can throw another particle to the black hole and change it again. Or I can remove one of the particles that went into the black hole and this way gradually build any other black hole states as the initial state of the black hole. Then I can ask what, in, what expect, in what respect does it shift the outgoing particles. Well, in every case, I can compute that. And inside the exponent, you know, in front of the exponent, you have to multiply the effects. But inside the exponent, the effects are just linear. 
the you add, so add them up. So you have to take the total sum of all momentum of the particles going in, and then this will shift all the particles, and actually it might define the position for all the particles altogether. I define the position of the outgoing particles with respect to what they would have been in, in, this, in this single state BH1. But now I can get all the other black hole states this way. So this way I can produce all other black hole states. I can compute what states the outcoming particles will be in for the new case. And this way I get a completely acceptable quantum mechanical description of the black hole. It relates the in-states with the out-states in a one-to-one -one way. Well, if you listen carefully, you might have noticed I skipped a few points in this argument. I said that if you know the location of the outgoing particles, you know everything. This is so far still an assumption, but it's a good assumption to start off with, that if I know the location of every single particle, I know exactly the quantum state. This is not quite obvious, and in the standard model, there are also things such as quantum numbers of black holes. Suppose I put in a, a baryon and I, I, uh, I replace it by an antibaryon, but I don't change the momentum. Then, according to this argument, the outgoing state will be the same. That would mean that two different in states give the same out state. That's forbidden in quantum mechanics. So I have to watch my steps here, and I have to say that apparently the proton and antiproton are not the same particles, not quite. So they give a slightly different shape of the shifted state later. That's a detail that has to be worked out. But apart from that, you get basically that the out states are going to be dependent on the in states in a one-to-one -one way. And uh, that will give you a new quantum mechanical theory for black holes. Um, that gives me a so-called scattering matrix, the S matrix, the thing that Hawking denied that exists, the thing, the th thing that string theorists say must exist. And um, um, here now I show how, in principle, you can compute that scattering matrix. However, there's a little footnote here, a footnote which at that time I didn't pick up at all. And the footnote is, yes, but you have to allow those outgoing particles to be anywhere, in particular, beyond the horizon. So you can shift across the horizon. That wasn't taken into account correctly yet. So, um, and also, the momentum can be positive or negative. And uh, you have to take all these things into account. So here were still some problems. I'm relating the sum of the momentum of all the ingoing particles with the average position of all the outgoing particles. So and though that relation should be a one-to-one -one relation. This led to a linear algebra. And um, the algebra it can then be completed by saying, wait a minute, I'm talking about positions and momenta positions of the outgoing particles and the momentum of the ingoing particles. Suppose I wanted you to talk about the positions of the ingoing particles or the momentum of the outgoing particles. Well, then you have to use what everybody does in quantum mechanics to say that positions and momentum do not commute. They are non-commuting operators. And the commutator can be written down in any decent quantum theory. It's basically a delta function. There are some complications here in the fact that I'm working on the horizon, which is a curved surface. So you have to make some small calculations or corrections here and there. But I, I won't boy, bother you too much with that. So omega here stands short for the solid angle normally given by two angles, theta and phi. And now look, do that for all the particles that go in and all the particles that come out. And this generates an algebra, a complete algebra, an algebra you can solve. The algebra looks amazingly similar to algebras used in string theory. In a sense, this is a Virasor al algebra. However, it's a lot simpler because I left out the difficult parts. In string theory, one uses this algebra, but one, the algebra becomes tremendously complicated if you want to understand that the theory is Lorentz invariant. And you have to make Lorentz transformations which turn this algebra, which act very nonlinearly in this algebra and which make things difficult. Actually, you do have the same thing here. So this algebra is unfinished. I, there are certain transformations which have to be worked out. Uh, rotations on the horizon, for instance, which have not been included in this. So the algebra is linear because I simplified things. And that's because I'm not as clever as string theorists. I just first solved the, the easy part. So these, this is the algebra, and this is the algebra you have to work with. That was in the 1980s that we did all this. And uh, oh yes, I have to say that the black hole itself is a representation of this algebra. That's the, the claim, the, the words you usually you work with in physics. <laughs> Particles are representations of the symmetry group. So the black hole is a representation of this algebra. And this representation obeys Schrodinger's equations. So is that all? No, that wasn't all. 
I had forgotten something. And what was forgotten was as a complication. I already mentioned it briefly. The pattern can be thrown through the horizon to the other side. What happens then? This was simply not understood in those days. But now let's think again whether we can answer that question. And the answer was staring in my face all the time and never did anything with it. The answer was, these equations are linear. This algebra is a linear algebra. So why not find a different frame to work with this algebra? So work with a particular basis. And what basis is better than the basis generated by the spherical harmonics? So that's also why I call this a hydrogen atom of quantum gravity. I'm going to expand the same thing in the same spherical harmonics that you're used to in solving the hydrogen atom in atomic physics. So let's do that expansion. And something marvelous came out. That expansion told me that if I take um, my, the positions of the outgoing particles and the momentum of the ingoing particles, I take the entire distribution over the horizon, I expand that, in, that contribution in spherical harmonics. So you have to work with the quantum numbers L and M. At every L and M, there's a spherical harmonic of ingoing things causing the outgoing things to be displacement, displaced. And that displacement is also described in terms of spherical harmonics. Something marvelous happens with the equations I wrote down. The marvelous thing is that the equations are linear, <coughs> and therefore they are diagonal in the L and M basis. So a, a given spherical wave of ingoing things only displaces the same spherical wave for the outgoing things. That means I've eliminated the two angles theta and phi. I've replaced that by a spherical harmonic. And then I have to work at one L and one M and do the entire calculation. The thing there is that what used to be complicated looking uh, um, functional, functional differential equations and functional integrals and so on now becomes something very simple. Just like the Schrodinger equation, which is a complicated four dimensional <coughs> Uh, differential equation for the hydrogen atom, it becomes very easy if you expand the wave function of the hydrogen atom in terms of spherical harmonics, which is all, always what, what we do. You write down the L and the M of an electron cloud on the hydrogen atom. So we do the same thing here. And then you find that the displacement of the outgoing stuff is directly proportional to the momentum of the ingoing stuff times a function depends on L. It happens to be L plus L plus 1. Uh, in the denominator. And there's Newton's constant standing in, in top, because that's Newton's force which, which caused this relation. Without taking this interaction, g would be 0, and there would be no such relation. So taking the gravitational force is very important in this whole argument. And I find that the u of L of m for the outgoing particles is given by the p L of m of the ingoing particles, just like in the hydrogen atom. And um, what this also says is that if you look at the wave functions now, it becomes very easy. These are wave functions in one dimension. Every undergraduate student can be taught what a wave function in one dimension is. It's just a plane wave going that way or that way. That's it. So it can't be easier, these equations. You can solve them. In fact, the fact that the positions of the outgoing particles are controlled by the momentum of the ingoing particles means that the wave function of the outgoing particles is the Fourier transform of the wave function of the ingoing particles. And that acts the other way around as well. So I can replace this p by u of the ingoing particles, and then you get a p here. But you get some minus signs which become different. So um, the outgoing wave is just a fluid transform of the ingoing wave. And that means that parts go in, they do something, and out come the outgoing particles. And the outgoing particles are the fluid transforms of the ingoing particles. This is lovely mathematics which you can use. And, um, but then. And this is so important why, to do, why doing this spherical wave expansion. What you discover is there's something very strange going on. The ingoing particle can be in the region 1. But the outgoing particle is a Fourier transform of the ingoing particle. Now, if you take a function which is only defined on a half of the real axis, you take its Fourier transform, <coughs> it flows over the entire real axis. It's non-vanishing everywhere. So if I take the ingoing wave just sitting in region 1 only, the outgoing wave spreads over region 1 and region 2. It has to because it's a Fourier transform. You can't have a half function and its Fourier transform also be a half function. It doesn't work that way. Mathematically, it will spread all over. So if the ingoing particle goes in in region 1, the outgoing particle goes in out in region 1 and region 2. The whole procedure would be beautiful and unitary in quantum mechanical terms. Except that I have to include both regions 1 and region 2. So there's something 
not understood here. This is a so-called Penrose diagram. Now, I don't know how many of you know what a Penrose diagram is. It is an abstract way of describing space and time surrounding a black hole. There's a region one describing the outside world. There's a region two, which was thought to be the inside of the black hole. But if you look at the Penrose diagram, the inside of the black hole looks very much like it's outside. It's just a mirror image. So this is another black hole somewhere else in the universe. That's what Hawking thought. That can't be, because these two parts now are seen according to these equations to talk to each other. If you send a particle in in one, outgoing particles will spread over one and two. That came out of the equations. And I have it quantified now. I have the exact equations. So you can't fool around with them. So something must be, be such that this region, too, must refer somehow to the same black hole. So some people thought, well, it, maybe it is the same black hole. So region 1 and 2 describe the same thing. You have to fold the whole thing over. But if you do that, you get a singularity at this point. That can't be right either. That's, again, against general relativity. Well, something terrible is going wrong here. Well, it turned out to be not so wrong after all. You have to, OK, yeah, this is the, um, the re what I'm said about displacement. So all the argon particles are being displaced. So here is a particle which is being displaced to the other side. And when I did the calculation, I made a mistake. Instead of having the particle continue this way, in my equation, I didn't realize the particle was moving in this direction. So this blue line goes here, sh it shifts, and then it gets out here. Well, I made the mistake for a good reason. If you make that mistake, the computation comes out beautifully. So the whole thing becomes a perfect unitary quantum mechanical evolution, just fine. And but then I thought, oh my god, I made a mistake. Now, how do I improve that? Well, let's change the rule. Let's change the rule. Let's say this mistake was actually correct. And then it works. But saying that the mistake was correct, you modify a little bit the laws of nature. And uh, so there was something very strange going on. <coughs> so again, in the 1920s, <laughs> spherical wave expansion showed you how to understand the quantum mechanics of the hydrogen atom. Now we see that partial wave equations also understand, make you understand how black holes behave. And, um, um, in, uh, th there are some subtle differences here that the partial waves are used in a black hole are not the wave functions of the particles. They are the momentum distributions of the particles. So there are some subtle differences between the hydrogen atom and the black hole. Sufficiently subtle to say these are two different things. I handle them physically different, but mathematically it's very similar. Actually, the strange way in which region 1 and region 2 are hanging together in this Penrose diagram is called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. It seems to be a, a, a bridge that connects two different regions of the universe. That's what Hawking all the time thought. But now, this bridge should somehow connect the black hole with itself. How can you do that? Well, the only way to make it work consistently is to say that the bridge brings you from one side of the black hole to the opposite side. So this is called the antipolar identification. And what is nice about this is that it's exactly one solution. You, you get exactly prescribed how to do this. And there's only one solution, to have a mapping of one side of the black hole to the other side of the black hole, such that if you do it twice, you get back to the same point again. There's only one solution, which is the parity transformation. You, you replace the point that's antipole. And these two points should be identified. In this way, you generate no singularity at the origin. For black holes that works for ordinary flat space, you can't do that. You would get generate a singularity. So in ordinary space, you can't say two opposite points are identified. You run into problems with the laws of nature. But for the black hole, you can do it without running into any problems locally. So there's no difficulty in assuming that. Region 2, therefore, describes the points on the horizon that are the antipodal points of region 1. Now, this works. And in fact, the Schrodinger equation you then get on the black hole is very simple. It is basically that the Hamiltonian is position times momentum, position of the um, Ingoing particle times momentum of the ingoing particles, or position of the outgoing particles times momentum of the outgoing particles. That is a physics well known as a dilaton operator, a dilatation operator, which expands things to and from the horizon. That's exactly. But now there's something else, which is the outgoing particles are related to the ingoing particles. And this gave me an expression for the scattering matrix. The expression is beautifully unitary but only if you combine region one with region two. So you have a two by two matrix, which as a two by two matrix is unitary, but it's not unitary if you leave off the, out the off diagonal terms. Region one talks to region two, and vice versa. So the black hole has two antipolar 
points which talk to each other. And that makes this thing something very special. And um, uh, so what does it mean? Well, you can think of a black hole as a sphere. So now I'm going to give the physical explanation or physical interpretation of what I'm doing. Normally, a black hole is, consists of an outside world, an inside world, and you believe that the horizon is a sphere. And if you fall into the black hole, you enter to its inside, inside, into its belly, and you're being eaten. And when you're eaten, you can't give away the secrets of your wave function anymore because you're being eaten up. That was a standard picture, but now it's something else. If you enter into the black hole, and here I have the arrow saying, I'm entering the black hole from that direction, you're not being eaten you emerge immediately at the other side. So the inside of the black hole is totally empty. There's nothing there. You go in, you re-emerge at the other side. Now, at first sight, when you see this, this you would say this is completely wrong. This can't be right, because you would go lo locally faster than light or something like that. But that's not true, because if you go in, you're first being tremendously slowed down when you enter the horizon. Actually, you come out beyond time equals infinity at the other side. So actually, it takes you a long time to cross the black hole that way. The only way in which you can cross the black hole in finite time is do the quantum gravity thing that you turn the ingoing wave into a Fourier transform to get out at the other side. But the Fourier transform comes out at both sides of the black hole. And, um, but mathematically, you can write down such spaces rather easily and, and find their marvelous properties. And now, I enter the subject of the firewalls. The firewall is nowadays portrayed in the literature as a mystery. People don't understand what a firewall is, how these Hawking particles accumulate against the horizon, which kill everything that wants to go through the horizon. There's something wrong about that. Well, um, uh, the answer is basically given here, and that is that now, we say that ingoing particles are related to the outgoing particles. If a particle goes into the black hole, it comes closer and closer to the horizon with a momentum that increases indefinitely. But the outgoing particles then come out with a wave function that gets out of the black hole with momentum decreasing exponentially and position increasing exponentially. So you interchange momentum and position. That's what interchanges in with out. And so we have outgoing particles. And the closer the ingoing particles goes into the black hole, making a nuisance of itself, making a firewall, the outer one particle leaves the black hole. And here comes the important observation. The outgoing wave function is a quantum clone, it seems, of the wave function being in. Quantum cloning is forbidden according to well-known laws of quantum mechanics. You get impossibilities with when particles are entangled. So you can't have quantum clones. Well, here you can, and the reason is that the ingoing particle cannot be seen anymore by the outside observer. Once a particle went through the horizon, it's lost. So don't worry. Nobody can see that you're quantum cloning. In fact, you're reproducing the wave function in terms of the outgoing particle where it originally went in. So this is the one version of quantum cloning that is allowed. Except you shouldn't describe the thing twice. You shouldn't have both the ingoing particle and the outgoing particle. Then you're overcounting. The situation is very similar to what you have if you look in the mirror. You have um, a box with a mirroring wall, and you have a particle sitting here, then when you describe the quantum mechanics, you also see the particle in the mirror image of the particle. But you should not describe the wave function of this particle and the wave function of the mirror image. No, there's only one wave function, and the mirror image is a quantum clone of that, but that should be thrown away. That mirror image is not real, it's just virtual. It's in your image, but it's not really physical. So now the claim is that the firewall is the mirror image of particles outside the black hole. The closer an ingoing particle attaches to the horizon, the further the outgoing particle is away from the black hole. Which of the two do you see? You don't see the ingoing particle. It's too close to the horizon. You can't get there to measure it. But you do see the particle outside. So now the rule is just only focus on the particles outside. Don't include the quantum clone that sits on this horizon. Remove it. It's not physical. And this is the procedure that I think resolves the, the firewall paradox, as people tend to call it. If the firewall can be removed this way, the only thing that is valid is the, particle, the wave function of the particle outside the black hole. So it does away with the firewalls. And uh, in a very similar way, it also does away with matter that formed the black hole. Because the firewalls are a problem for the future horizon. But matter which formed the black hole by implosion sits on the past horizon. 
But by time reversal, the same argument holds there. So now you can see you get a beautiful description of black hole, which is symmetric on the time reversal, which all the, all the picture wasn't. And now this basically solves the problem. But the expenses, yes, you do require new physics. This identification of the antipode is something that wasn't put in. We had to put it in by hand, so to speak. But um, it was the only so solution that works. Everything else would make the black hole violate basic concepts of physics, like non-locality. It would communicate with other black holes in a way that is illegal according to normal physics. So this is the only legal way to make the black hole behave. And this would be the legal way to proceed to try to do quantum gravity. Uh, this is just a side remark that the, way, the partial ways I'm looking at all have to have an odd value for their quantum number L. And the even values are forbidden. That's because the, the, when I look at the spherical harmonic functions, I need, if you, if you go to the antipodes, the sign should switch. But then I may only use spherical harmonic function at YLM, which has a property that if I go to the antipode, I should pick up a minus sign. And that's what the, all the spherical harmonics do if L is odd. So I should only use the odd spherical harmonics. This also gives rise to heated discussions. People don't believe that, that because they thought that L equals 0 is the easiest thing you can consider. But L equals 0 is excluded because it's even. I can only allow for odd black holes. So, I th so the question is, what are the implications for the nature of space-time? <coughs> Much of this is still a mystery. So this is only a beginning step. And I believe is that uh, once people accept this first step, they might be able to apply it to the rest of, uh, of quantum gravity and see where it brings us. We don't know. But I see that some fundamental principles have to be, form have to be formulated differently. And then you can understand how black holes behave. But right now, what I see is a black hole can be described as simply as a hydrogen atom. I haven't mentioned some of the complications in this argument. It's not exactly as easy as I portrayed it now. There are some, some problems with very large spherical harmonics at very large values of L. You have to remove or only, only keep low values of L, but, but don't take L so large that, the, that things start to move in the sideways directions. <laughs> then you are in, in a problem. This part of the theory has not yet been solved. So there's still many, many things to be done, much more has to be done, which is the last line of my talk. So I reached this curly line, which means that I've, I've come to the end of my talk. Uh, again, I want to congratulate uh, Pierre and hope that he still has a very fruitful life as being retired. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to thank you very much. So I think I see how this works, how this algebraic structure arises if you have a pre-existing black hole. Yes. Suppose, however, I take some state. But if I, if I imagine taking some tiny ripple in some scalar field at a very large radius locally, there's no energy, very little energy, but it's all headed inward. And eventually, sometime far in the future, if I follow things classically, a black hole would form. Um, I think I, if I were to follow your prescription, I couldn't describe that state uh, using, how shall I put it, the normal approach to quantum mechanics. I would have to yeah. use your algebra in a situation where the state doesn't yet know that a black hole is going to form and it's going to have a horizon to deal with in the future. Uh, could well, you comment on that? Yes, I have. A, well, when you, uh, when you have a situation as you describe that at some point a black hole is being formed, you start up with a, a relatively flat domain of space and time where the horizon opens up. Yeah. Once you enter that flat domain, you can't, you can't avoid a black hole anymore. You are being swallowed by it. That's where I now apply the so-called new physics, where I just make a mapping. Locally, there's flat space time. So a local observer doesn't notice anything. It's like a polar bear who doesn't know that he goes through uh, through the horizon or not. But, um, uh, but globally, one says, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to make this transformation, like going from position space to momentum space. You can do that any time you want in quantum mechanics. It doesn't really matter. So I'm going from one basis to the other basis. Uh, my Cauchy surface is now stretching f between both regions. And uh, the mapping from states in, in the 
as seen by local observer to states by the, by the global observer is a one-to-one -one mapping. That's because both regions one and region two mean something. So I can always make this mapping for even if, even if I don't really know for sure whether a black hole forms at all. But uh, you have already, you prepare the thing to be described in the right way so that if a black hole forms, I can take into account what happens. So it's not necessarily a contradiction, although if you say it's not yet totally clear, then I would agree with you. One should be able to formulate this better. But basically, I don't see any. To me, like, you, you couldn't have the most general, as it were, initial state in order to. No, you can. You can take the most general initial state you like. But I do. OK, uh, one important condition is I describe the black hole as if it is a background metric with on that metric soft particles. And with soft, I mean their momenta are, are small compared to the Planck scale. The uh, Planck, scale, Planck, limit is a, a Planck value is the limit of the momenta and the, and the energies of these particles. So as soon as a particle has more energy than that, it causes curvature of space time. I say then it is a quantum clone of another particle being further out. Here, here, Francesca Vidotto. Um, a crucial, thank you very much for your very clear exposition. And uh, a crucial point uh, in your argument is uh, how to identify the region one with the region two. Yes. And uh, your solution is to say, OK, let's do a parity transformation. So my question is, why don't, you, don't we do a time transformation? So why don't we reverse just time? And let me just give you an argument for this. Uh, when we uh, work with the wave function of the universe, the hart locke wave function of the universe, in order to give uh, consistent uh, boundary conditions, we have to take a real function. So taking into account the probability of one time direction of the other one. So why wouldn't be here be the same? Uh, if you look carefully here, the top figure, um, the, the fat uh, blue line is an equal timeline. So when time goes forward in region <laughs> one, it goes backward in region two. So yeah. to make identification proper, you first have to switch over region two. That's very important. So uh, region two is the antipode, but when time goes forward in region one, it goes backward in region two. So, um, so you have to flip it over. That's the, the way the identification goes. So strictly speaking, if you go through the horizon, you're being PCT inverted. There's a parity switch. If you look carefully, you find out that when you go through the right to the other side, you, you enter into your, you emerge in your mirror image. Yeah. And since quantum field theory is only PCT invariant, but not doesn't have any of the, of the sub invariances, so then it means that, that it, you better also assume that there's a C, but there's also a T. So the Hawking particles also seem to be going backwards in time. <coughs> that you don't see because it's just a, 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 a trajectory. So you just see the trajectory. So you would say it goes forward in time. But it is a PCT transformation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, w when you do this partial wave expansion, and in the end you only keep the odd L, that's something we see. Like if you know, if we look at the Laplace on a sphere, and you want to impose Neumann boundary conditions on the equator, but that seems to single out a special line. I mean, is there anything like this in? No, you your thing should be completely rotational invariant, right? This is rather unique, but uh, but. Um, uh, I get into conflict if I take even L. So for even L, for instance, if you have a particle going in at this side and a particle goes in at the other side with the same sign, the effects cancel each other out. Yeah. So I would get two different in states and the same out state. That's not allowed. So I can't allow for equal L, I for, for even L. I must uh, insist that L is only odd. And uh, no, I don't know where else this happens in physics. There's something to be. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know what, uh, what other systems have this. Yeah, uh, I, I wonder, uh, in your picture, if you just let your microstate evaporate, you know, just don't send anything in. Uh, so that will evaporate in a, in a perfectly coherent way. You will not yes. lose information. Um, so that means the, the outcome should not be thermal, should not right. be exactly thermal. So what, what, what would be the deviation from thermality? I mean, how, how can you describe the final state of the? So now, th this region one, this region one, region two now refer to antipolar opposite points. So if you look, only look at half of the black hole, 
everything looks perfectly thermal because you okay. don't see the other half, therefore you average over it and you're back into but thermal it's description. Just on the other hemisphere. But if you do look at the other uh, atmosphere, it's no longer thermal. So, uh, so. for instance, <laughs> if you have, imagine that the temperature has become 100 MeV. 100 MeV, so that a proton would nearly never come out. With probability e to the minus 9, it gives you a proton. So it's very improbable, but e to the minus 9 is not such a small number. So every now and then a proton comes out in region 1. Mm -hmm. Then immediately another the proton other or antiproton comes out in region 2. Not further suppressed by another factor e to the minus 9, but by factor 1. So uh, now you see that there's a complete entanglement between the point with Hawking particles coming out here and Hawking particles coming out at the other side. So, um, uh, so that's not thermal because if it were thermal, there would be another factor e to the minus nine for the other proton, yeah. but there isn't. I understand. According to this theory, so, so I'm so saying the, this, this is where it stops you being thermal. Information. But as long as you only look at one half the black hole, everything seems to be perfectly thermal. Otherwise, if you look at both sides, the the, the, the final state will depend on the microstate. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And, and the other question is, what happens to the singularity if you erase the interior? There is no singularity anymore. There is a singularity. Singularity becomes more complicated, but that's where r goes to zero. Yeah, I know. It's right. So at r I mean, equals zero, I mean the antipolar identification generates another conical set of singularity. But r equals zero was singular anyway for the Schwarzschild black holes. So having this on top of it doesn't change much. From the, okay. Thanks. It's a very naive question, but I I'm, uh, don't understand why you consider a black hole as a pure quantum state. Let me say that. We, we know many black holes in the universe. Now, it's not a, a strange thing. And they are formed by matter which uh, coalesces. And this matter is not in a pure quantum state. So if you say that the black hole is a quantum state, uh, then you have evolved from a non-quantum state to a quantum state, which is the opposite of the problem. So I'm a little bit uh, confused. Uh, what okay. happens uh, to the entropy of the original particles that uh, coalesce into a black hole if you say that the black hole is in a pure state? But even if, if the original <coughs> black hole the black hole originates from states in a thermal state. What you really mean is that you don't know the initial state with sufficient accuracy. You don't. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of pure states that all have a probability. You know how to describe mixed state. You say it has a pure state, but has certain probability of being in this state or that state or that state or that state. Now, the fact that you introduce probabilities there comes because you don't know which of these states is, is really describing the right, the right thing. Just when I describe a bucket of water, I don't know where all the atoms are, and I don't know what their momentum and so on is. I can't describe a bucket of water in a single pure state. The best I can do is write down all the pure states that exist, uh, for which you need a, a very smart notation, of course, because there are very many of them. And then you write down the probability of all these states to be realized. It doesn't mean that nature chose that state. It just means that we chose that state because we don't know any better about the bucket of water. But uh, if you would know, if you would have perfect information, you could describe the bucket of water in terms of a pure state. Of course. The question then is, what is its entropy? Well, entropy is a kind of, of measure of, of, of un, un, non-information that you have about the system. So if you have infinite information, the entropy, in a formal sense, becomes zero. But uh, you also know that that's not really what happens in the real world. Even a bucket of water, it can still freeze over or, or evaporate uh, uh, as water does, even if it were in a pure state. That's, but it's too complicated to describe under all of the circumstances. So, um, uh, so I want to describe the initial state as a pure state, but if you describe the initial state as a pure state, the final state should be pure as well. But in practice, of course, you're quite right. You, you describe the initial state only as a mixture. Then the, outside, the outcoming state will also be in a mixture. And will, it will look much more like thermal, but not exactly. And I still, I still think that there will be this, this strange, uh, um, uh, what called, um, um, well, uh, entanglement between the in and outgoing particles. So that entanglement will, if all is well, not go away completely. So when, it, when you allow the black hole to evaporate, you'll still see the entanglement between the, in and, uh, between the Hawking particles on one side and the other side. So that's where you could really do an experiment on black holes. If you had one, 
you would do an experiment, put a detector here, put a detector there, and see whether the particles coming out are entangled. That should be observable. Okay, one last question. Could, could we do the twin paradox here? In other words, <laughs> can, if I understand you correctly, uh, I have a twin pair, uh, one of them stays home, and one of them rides a spaceship through the event horizon, out the other side, and presumably can come back and rejoin his, his fellow. And uh, if I understand you correctly, the clock on the spaceship will have advanced a finite amount of time. And the question is, what will the <coughs> comparison twins clock have done during this this voyage, when the two come back together? Well, you can't do that exactly, because regions one and region two here describe different domains of the universe. So you can have someone sitting in region one, and I say you want him to go to region two. Unfortunately, he can't, because he has to go faster than the local speed of light. So he can't. So in, in, all he can do is end up in region three, have himself Fourier transformed, and then come out. Well. I think for being fully transformed is bad for your health. You can't come back to the, the twin. No, so there's no paradox because a twin can, cannot make a journey. I propose that we break here. We thank again Herod. <laughs>